In our last video on digital night vision, I mentioned that part two would be about the night vision of the future and some of the advantages that digital devices will eventually have. And we're still going to do that video, but first we have to take a quick detour to talk about a digital night vision device of the present, the Psionics Aurora. Now we've been playing with this for a few months now, and in short, I'm a lot more impressed with it than I thought I was going to be. But before we get to that, let me address some of the comments from the last video. I think this is worth pointing out. We're not actually looking at the highest tech, most speculative, best of the best of the best night vision equipment. We're looking at the best unclassified infantry level night vision tech that you can buy today. If you want to talk about non-existent vaporware stuff, well, you can't really test that. If you want to talk about giant liquid cool hybrid digital analog night vision stuff, well, that'd be fun because there's some incredibly awesome devices that are used on military vehicles like tanks and gunships, but I'm not really the right person to be talking about EBAPs or anything like that. Here at T-Rex Arms, we specialize in small arms. And that's not just a joke, that's where our experiences and interests are. We don't have any giant electro-optical vehicle mounted sensors yet, but right now we're trying to focus on small arms, man portable, accessible, and affordable. And the Aurora is really affordable. It's also really tough to review because it's a one of a kind device, which means it's the best of its kind, but it also is a do it all device. And so we're gonna need to compare it to five or six different things. Now there's gonna be a table of contents down in the video description, which might come in handy because I think this is gonna take a while. So the Aurora is 800 bucks MSRP, but it's about $600 on sale and has been on sale quite a bit recently. And price is one of its most important features. Did I mention it was affordable? It's uh, roughly the same size as a PVS-14. Uh, it's a little bit lighter. Uh, it fits very comfortably in the hand. It's fairly rugged. It's got uh, IP67 water protection certification, so half a meter of water for a little while shouldn't give it any trouble. And on the front, we have a 47 millimeter equivalent lens uh, with manual focus and uh, a f1.4 aperture with three manual iris settings, day, twilight, and night. And night is the most fun because as soon as you switch it from twilight mode into night mode, you hear a little and that is the sound of the IR filter getting out of the way. So the way that this works is we have an IR filter for our first two modes so that it looks like a regular visual camera during the day. But when we switch to night mode, we have access to the full IR spectrum from 400 nanometers all the way up to 1100, which is very cool if you know why that's cool. On the back, we've got a rubber eyepiece that's pretty hard and unforgiving. Inside is a 720p OLED panel, which has great resolution. It's very crisp, it's very colorful, it has great contrast. The optics in front of it are not quite as good. Uh, the diopter that lets you focus for your personal eye is not bad, but the magnification is, is really lacking. I've used a lot of viewfinders on different video cameras over the years, and uh, while it's an excellent image that's inside here, um, it's a very cramped and very unmagnified image, which makes more sense when you're trying to use this for other things, and we'll talk about that later. There's a control dial on the side that gives you different shooting modes, playback mode, and settings. And then up here, you've got a D-pad for your zoom and exposure compensation menu and record, which are pretty easy to operate in the dark. Now, underneath the viewfinder is the battery compartment, and I love that they went with a non-proprietary pre-existing Fujifilm battery that you can get for about $5, and it powers the camera for about two hours, but you can also charge it through this micro USB port here. And it takes uh, micro SD cards for recording, but uh, maximum of 32 gigabytes, which is actually not a problem because the size of the video files and photos you'll be taking are very small because of the low resolution and low bit rate. Now the sensor is something that we need to talk more about because it's the heart of this device. It's a relatively large one inch CMOS chip with a relatively small 720p resolution. 
Actually, that's, that's not relatively small. That's very, very small in 2019. But that is the secret to its low light sensitivity. I know there's gonna be some comments mentioning that photo site size has nothing to do with sensitivity because quantum, and I agree in theory, but functionally, realistically speaking, the best way to increase low light performance is to decrease resolution to get a bigger pixel size. When Sony wanted a more sensitive A7, they made one with a lower resolution chip. When Panasonic wanted a more sensitive GH5, they made a version with lower resolution. And when Psyonix wanted to make a low light camera, they picked a big sensor with a very, very low resolution. And it's important to note that this device uh, was designed primarily to be a night specific action cam, and that's also how it's primarily being marketed. It's small, it's rugged, uh, it definitely looks the part, but it also looks a lot better than its competitors, but only after the sun goes down. As you can see, the GoPro looks better during the day, and you can really see the limitations of the Aurora's 720p resolution. But when night comes, the tables are turned. Even without IR, the bigger sensor and lower resolution give it a much better image. And then in night mode, it can see things when the GoPro just can't. In fact, its low light sensitivity is almost 90% of what our IR modified A7 is. And that's extremely impressive to me. I'm gonna be a little hard on this device as a camera because it's not really a filmmaking tool by any stretch of the imagination, but it is technically very impressive and it definitely has a use for certain people. If you've got a YouTube channel where you track animals or do astronomy stuff or shoot guns in the dark, then this is great. If you're a professional filmmaker that wants to shoot in the dark though, uh, this is a pretty limited camera that's very limiting. It's, it's got a bunch of shooting modes like panoramas and time lapses, but I wouldn't even bother with those. Its main limitation is this 720p resolution and the bit rate is so low that it looks even worse. Now the lens is not bad, but it's not wide enough for selfie mode and it's not tight enough to zoom in on a soccer game. It's just a kind of a generic lens. And there's a few weird distortions inside, but you would never notice those if I hadn't pointed them out. But what you would notice is just the general uh, quality of the image that comes from a 720p sensor that is not really optimized uh, for overall image quality, but is optimized for maximum low light sensitivity. Even if you wanted to just use this as a personal camcorder during a family outing to a dimly lit Christmas light event, the results would be um, kind of uneven. In the dark, it would definitely look cleaner and more colorful than your phone, but in other circumstances, it just wouldn't look quite as good. It could be improved if it had manual white balance and a maximum ISO setting, but at the moment, it's pretty much just a full auto machine except for the manual focus. So if you have a professional need for a really good night vision camera, you should go with the Sony A7S Mark II. It shoots 4K on a stabilized sensor and it looks really good in the dark and it looks really good in the day. It's got a ton of shooting modes and it's my favorite video camera ever for whatever that's worth. It's getting pretty cheap these days and you can then pay to remove the IR filter and then buy another drop in iron filter and then buy a whole bunch of lenses. But if you only need a specialty night vision camera, you can get this for considerably less. I almost wonder if Psyonix has done themselves a disservice by marketing this as an action cam because I think that where it really shines is as a night vision monocular. Now we're gonna compare the Aurora to this PVS-14, uh, which has been built on an L3 Gen 3 unfilmed white phosphor image intensifier tube. And if you watched our earlier night vision video, then this comparison won't come as much of a surprise, but this time I tried to make it a slightly more scientific test. In order to get laboratory conditions, I went into my mostly windowless basement on an overcast moonless night where none of the devices could see anything. And then I slowly uncovered a white light and an IR flashlight that were both pointing at the opposite wall. And I tried to be very evenly increasing the amount of light that I was letting into the room. The PVS-14 could see a usable image in three seconds. The A7S in 10 seconds. And the Aurora in 13 seconds. I said slightly more scientific, but based on this, my estimation is that these devices need roughly 
this much light to get a usable image. The photo cathode in this PVS-14 is so obviously the clear winner here. But let's remember how much each of these devices cost. And some of the Aurora's limitations as a video camera are not really limitations of a night vision monocular. The Aurora costs twice as much as this new GoPro, but it's only a fraction of a PVS-14. And 720p is a terrible camera res, but it's actually on par with most good Gen 3 night vision. Now, none of us T-Rex folks actually own a Gen 2 tube, but folks online are saying that the sensitivity of this device is very similar to regular middle of the road Gen 2, which tends to cost roughly twice as much. Obviously, there's a lot of grades of Gen 2 tubes and there's a lot of different prices, but on average, maybe we should assume that this device offers twice the sensitivity per dollar than a Gen 2 tube. And we should also remember that there's more to a night vision device than just raw light sensitivity. Once the Aurora has enough light to work, then the resolution and clarity of the image are more like an average Gen 3 tube than Gen 2. And let's not forget that this thing sees in color. In these tests, the PVS-14 sees more clearly in really low light, but it can't really tell the difference between a gas can and a water jug. Color could be really useful for a lot of applications, even at the expense of sensitivity. And there's a lot of other extras too, like the ability to record what you see, which is huge. And there's image stabilization, which might be kind of nice. And it's got a compass and GPS, so you can see your heading and location coordinates in the viewfinder, along with clock and battery life and all of your settings. And that time-lapse mode that I said that I would never use for photography does kind of make this into a sort of security camera. And it has Wi-Fi, so you can stream that security camera footage straight to your phone. Uh, but I can't demonstrate that because my phone is busy being a teleprompter right now. But overall, I'd have to say that this thing is so cheap and rugged and small that it's worth having to do a whole bunch of different jobs. If I were still a first responder, this would totally be in my crash bag all the time. Even though it's not a thermal viewer, it still sees high heat sources like hot metal or small flames, or IR lights on hidden security cameras, or if you've got your own $5 IR illuminator, you can see veins under the skin. And since it's not ITAR controlled, you can travel with it anywhere in the world. And that's, that's a huge deal. Now, obviously a helmet mounted night vision device is more useful than a handheld one for certain things. But this is where we start to run into some of the Aurora's limitations. And I know you want to see this helmet, but you're watching a video on budget night vision stuff, so we're gonna use the budget helmet. The first thing you notice when you go to mount something under the J-arm is that it has this little notch, which corresponds to this divot in a PVS-14. The Aurora doesn't have one of those, but it's good enough for a test. Second thing you notice is that it's upside down, but that's okay because there's an image flip setting in the menu. And you'll notice that it sits at an angle. Technically all of the tubes will sit at an angle, but you don't notice it when it's a round tube the way that you do when you've got a rectangular display with data overlays. It's not unworkable, but it is slightly annoying. Now what's more annoying is the image lag. The time that it takes for the light to enter the lens, get digitized, processed, and then appear on the viewfinder. If you have image stabilization on, it's over 100 milliseconds. Without, it's more like 50 to 60, which is pretty bad. VR researchers believe that latency needs to be between seven and 15 milliseconds to be really invisible to the user. Now interestingly, the A7 viewfinder is about 15 milliseconds. And this is what 60 milliseconds looks like. It's basically unnoticeable when you hand hold the device, but as soon as you strap it to your head and it becomes one of your eyes, it's pretty rough. What's worse though is the eye relief. Now remember how I mentioned uh, how the viewfinder had very little magnification? Well, as a handheld, you can really push your eye in close to make the most of it. But with the head mounted display, you can't get this much closer to your eyeball and that small image gets even smaller. Now, I've tried to film what exactly that looks like from all of these different devices and I couldn't figure out a way where it was really usable. So I'm going to just animate it and uh, you'll just have to trust me that I do it properly.
The PVS-14's lens has a field of view of about 40 degrees, and the Aurora's lens has a field of view of 42. But that's horizontal. Since it's widescreen, there's more width and a lot less height. However, since the magnification in the viewfinder is not great, and because the Aurora sits further from your eye on the helmet mount, the image is shrunk, and so that 42 degree lens is not taking up 42 degrees of your actual view. And to get a proper one-to-one -one view, you have to use the digital zoom on the device, so you're also losing some resolution. Trying to walk around in the woods using this device was not great. A real night vision device is already tricky to navigate with because it's like looking through a toilet paper tube, but this is like looking through a much smaller square toilet paper tube with lag. Now the good news is that Psyonix should be able to improve the helmet mount experience. It's possible that there could be a clip-on magnifier that improves the size of the viewfinder image and the eye relief, especially since there are these little recessed areas that look like they were made for something to clip onto them. And if that's not possible, the battery cap contains the entire viewfinder assembly. So you could theoretically get an upgraded version of this, which would give you enough magnification for it to be a decent head-mounted device, or enough eye relief that it would be a decent weapon-mounted device. It would still have lag, though, unless they can improve that in firmware, which I'm a little doubtful of. But something that probably is coming in a future firmware upgrade is a zeroable reticle so that it can be used on a rifle as a night vision scope. I'm not convinced that this quarter inch mounting hole is really sufficient for that. I think what's best is to put it behind an existing optic and think of it as a night vision clip-on. Now, Psyonix has tested this on an M4 recoil simulator and found that it would work for a few thousand rounds. Now, I'd certainly not put this on anything uh, that has more recoil than a 5.56 DI gun. I thought that the Tavor would be a good fit because it's got light recoil, a really long rail to use as an optical bench. The Meprolite sight is the right height for the mount that I have and it's a very clear window, but mostly because I just wanted to shoot it some more. Now again, the lack of eye relief is a big issue. You have to bring your eye really, really close to that hard rubber scope, at which point it bangs you in the eyebrow every time you fire. Now the good news is you can use the diopter to focus so that you can come back just a little bit and still see the center of the image. And uh, it works pretty well for seeing the dot. In fact, much better than I expected given all the issues that we had mounting it on a helmet. Now we did this test in a deep holler on a moonless night and had to use a handheld flashlight bounced off the side of the hill to even see the target, but once I could pick it out, it was very easy to hit. I think once you disconnect the device from your head, uh, your brain is a lot less bothered by the lag and all of the other issues. I would say to probably only use this with static targets, or at the very least targets that are moving in a straight line. Because you have to remember that the image that you're seeing through the Aurora is technically 60 milliseconds in the past, so you have to adjust your shooting expectations accordingly. But you can also record video from the past once you switch into this loop mode, which is constantly buffering 30 seconds of footage into memory. And as soon as the accelerometers feel the recoil of a shot, they record the 15 seconds before the shot and the 15 seconds after the shot onto the card, which is really useful for, I guess, recording hunting trips. Um, I think that a good red dot, the Aurora, and an IR weapon light, or even a handheld light, would be a pretty good package for varmint hunting, but the varmints would need to be pretty close, since there's no way to attach a zoom lens to the front of the Aurora. It does have a digital zoom, but with its incredibly limited resolution, it's really hardly worth using. But overall, the rifle test went so well that I decided to try hand-holding the Aurora and shooting through an RMR on a pistol. The reason I'm shooting lefty is that I broke my right hand three weeks ago, and it's still very painful to shoot. But that's not why I'm having trouble. Oh, I cannot find the dot. Well, man, I need more light. Where are you?
the resolution, field of view, and eye relief issues that we've talked about mean that the RMR window is very tiny, and the lag means that as soon as I see the dot on target and pull the trigger, my point of aim has already moved past the target. Uh, no, the problem is the dot. Even finding the dot in the window is a challenge. 60 milliseconds of latency is not much, but it means that I have to move ridiculously dot? slowly to find the dot in my 10 pixel RMR window. Oh man, I saw it a second ago. Ah, uh, there it is. But then I tried the same thing with the PVS-14 and I did better. Not good, but better. And this last test is the perfect place to wrap up what we think of the Psyonix Aurora. If you're a filmmaker who needs a night vision camera and you can't afford to IR convert this, then you should buy this. But if you're looking for night vision capability in a self-defense or home defense scenario, you should not get anything less than a halfway decent Gen 3 tube. I don't care if your budget is only $600, you should spend it on a weapon light and training ammo. Now most people on the internet are comparing this directly to a Gen 3 night vision device and trying to figure out how it can be used for shooting, myself included, but that's not what this was designed for. I would say this is a fine thing for plinking and hunting and experimenting, environment control, but if lives are on the line, in the dark, get a weapon light or night vision devices that were designed for fighting. I don't care what the Delta seals in the comments say, this thing is not gonna replace PVS-31s for tier one operator types because it is not a weapon component. But that being said, it's also not a toy. This is the first digital night vision device that is legitimately more useful than a flashlight and still affordable. The Aurora offers roughly Gen 2 performance at half the price of a Gen 2 tube, and it does a bunch of things that even a Gen 3 tube can't. And those extra capabilities like color and recording don't overcome the limitations like lag, but they do add a bunch of new uses. This has the potential to add night vision capability to people or situations or jobs where you wouldn't normally have it. This could build a new market for consumer and commercial night vision use that has never existed before. And Psyonix is in a great position to build and capitalize on that market. This is their first consumer device, and it's really good for a first try. It's also the first Kickstarter project that any of us ever backed that arrived on time, which I think is equally impressive. And consumer hardware is not even their main line. Psyonix was founded by a couple of Harvard professors who discovered something called black silicon, which drastically improves light sensitivity and dynamic range over regular silicon sensors. They sell those sensors to commercial and military customers. Now, I'm willing to bet that there is no black silicon in the Aurora because the performance of its sensor is just a little bit behind this sensor, which is definitely standard garden variety silicon. And that means that Psyonix is developing their ability to manufacture groundbreaking sensors and mass produced consumer tech at the same time, which makes me very optimistic about what the next night vision device is that Psyonix will release. That and the quality and usability of the Aurora. I hope you found this review helpful in deciding whether or not you should get one. And in our next video, we'll get back into discussing the future of digital night vision, which seems like it might be coming even sooner than I had expected. Thanks for watching.